everyone, welcome. Don't know if you've heard about this one. Black Hebrew Awakening, the final 400 years of slaves in America, Dante Fortson. And I will give your pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. Jeremiah 3.15 Chapter 1. In the beginning. What if everything we were taught about the Bible and history was only a small part of the truth when it comes to the Garden of Eden? We are often bombarded with information about the Middle East, but rarely is that focused on the fact that one of the rivers encompassed the major portion of Africa. Paintings, TV shows and movies create our perception of Eden for us, but rarely do the words of the Bible taken into consideration when the images were shown and are created. The automatic assumption is that Adam and Eve were Caucasian. For the last 700 years, Europeans have been in a position of power, which has allowed them to influence the way the world perceives people in the Bible. In order to come out of the deception and break off the change of deception, we must start at the very beginning so that we can understand not only the truth, but also the lies which have been used to keep the truth hidden from us. Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and she show thee great and mighty things, which knoweth not. Jeremiah 33.3 the location of Eden, the cradle of civilization, is believed to be where mankind got its start. All of my life I've heard two different arguments of where it actually occurred, Africa and Mesopotamia, Middle East. There's no way both arguments can be right, or could they? In Western society, we tend to think the Middle East is some separate area, not associated with Africa, but that could be further from the truth. The Middle East was physically connected to Africa until the Suez Canal was built in 1869 to permanently separate Africa from Israel before the European invasion. Most of the area was under African control for thousands of years. Let's look at a map of Africa, Israel and the Middle East before we continue. Pay special attention to where each is located. If there is still doubt in your mind as to the physical connection of Israel to Africa, here is a tectonic plate map. Note that Israel is part of the African plate. Now we have a clear idea where everything is located on a map. It seems obvious that the cradle of civilization can't be located both in Africa and Middle East. Africa is part of the African plate, Mesopotamia is part of the African plate, Arabian plate. I struggled with the definitive answer for a long time until I decided to take a study on the Garden of Eden. The answer to this question may lie in what we know about pre-divide geography. Pre-divide geography, science supports the belief that Earth was a single landmass named Pangaea before it was divided. It was the study of a Garden of Eden that prompted me to take a deeper look into Pangaea, the name that the scientists gave the world before the Earth was rearranged by continental drift. Take a look at the following map of what scientists believed the world to look like before it was divided. If we look at the pre-divide map based on the continental drift theory, we see that Saudi Arabia and the Cradle of Civilization are connected to Africa. Nothing else, not Europe or Asia. This scientific theory actually supports both sides of the argument because the current Middle East was once considered to be part of Africa. Some believe the continental drift theory supports the following verse. And unto Eber was born two sons. The name of one was Peleg, for his days on earth were divided, and his brother's name was Jochen. Genesis 10.25 We could argue that because the earth was one giant landmass, however, there was no Africa at the time, and that would be correct. However, while it wasn't Africa in name, People with similar skin colour still inhibited the area, pre- and post-divide. In order to understand the origin of these people, we need to start in the Garden of Eden. Those that dismiss Pangaea as valid science probably do so hold on to the belief that Israel is part of Asia and not Africa. Let's look into the difference between Eden and the Garden of Eden. Eden was not the garden. This is simple, but overlooked minor detail. The garden was planted in Eden, but the garden was not Eden. To understand where the garden was, we need to consider where the garden was. And the Lord planted a garden eastward of Eden, and there he put the man whom he formed. Genesis 2.8 We see the garden was planted eastward in Eden, and if we accept the explanation that the garden was in Mesopotamia, we need to understand where Mesopotamia is. As the map shows, Mesopotamia takes up the entire area, separating the Middle East from Asia. This area is known as the Fertile Crescent. If we refer back to the Pangea map, we will see that the Fertile Crescent was far east as anyone could travel before running into the ocean, pre-continental drift or pre-divide. If the garden was planted in the east, it means Eden also encompassed the land to the west of Africa. On the Pangaea map, the land is the West Arabia, Africa, South America, and a small portion of Florida. One of the final explanations for Eden is that it could represent the entire landmass as what we refer as Pangaea. However, when we look at the biblical geography, the only locations mentioned in Africa are the Arabian and Arabian rivers. The names of those rivers are the Poison, Gerhain, Heidel, and Euphrates, all in Genesis. The Euphrates run right through the Fertile Crescent, but we do not see the other rivers. In order to get a better idea, 
Let's look at the locations of Halava and Ethiopia. It's important to understand that even though Moses is writing about pre-flood events, he was using post-flood, post-divide geography to explain where everything was in his present time. The map shows that Halava was most of Arabian Peninsula, which on the Pangaea map was part of Africa and only Africa. Now let's look at the location size in modern day Ethiopia. The problem with figuring out how large the river was was the size of Ethiopia it has changed throughout Jewish history. At one point, the entire continent of Africa was called Ethiopia, but what do we know is the river must have been larger than usual in order to make Mo for Moses to emphasize that it encompassed Ethiopia. After looking at the modern maps, we see that Ethiopia is right across the Red Sea from Halawa. This means that the Garden of Eden was relatively close to these areas, which means that Eden, not the Garden, likely included those areas. Bible fact, the Garden of Eden was destroyed in Noah's flood. Those that go looking for it probably won't find it exists exact location ever, but the land referred to Eden still exists today. An honest discussion about the location of Eden must include Africa, but it's rare that it gets mentioned. The reason for that may be once we start discussing Africa, it makes us call into the question of Caucasian paintings of Adam and Eve where used to see. Caucasian skin was not designed for daily life in Africa without modern anemones such as sunscreen and air conditioning. This brings us to the image of God. Let's make man in our image. In the beginning, the Most High created man in his image, but that image would need to include the ability to live in harsh African sun after being booted from the garden. Why does it matter that Adam and the Creator look like? It's not about race. God doesn't care about skin color. These are the arguments made by people in fear of truth. In most cases, it comes from Europeans, but not always. There are some Hebrew brothers and sisters that just accept what they've been told to believe and just don't want to start asking questions. Nobody says it's about race when the Irish people want to celebrate their history and apply it to Irish people. Nobody says it's about race when we discuss Native American history and apply it to Native Americans. Nobody says it's about race when we want to book, talk about Mexican history and apply it to Mexicans. The only time people get shifty and want to change the subject about race is when it comes to the Bible being the history of descendants of the transatlantic slave trade. Ask yourself, why are the double standards exist? It's because there are things that we aren't supposed to know about the Bible and how it pertains to the descendants of the transatlantic slave trade. Control the church, control the community. During slavery, black people weren't allowed to read, but many people would sneak and read the Bible under the fear of the beatings and sometimes death. Those that understood the words of the Bible also understood that something didn't quite add up. What was being taught in the book was much different than the religion and actions being practiced by Europeans. Europeans were committing rape of men and women, which the Bible forbids. Europeans were practicing lifetime slavery, which the Bible forbids. Europeans were practicing brutality of slaves, which the Bible forbids. In order for the Europeans to do what they did, they were forced to create a religion around the Bible, but not based on the Bible. This is a shell assumed the name Christianity to connect it. It was the Bible, even though it has no connection to Scripture at all. It is true that the believers in Christ were called Christians in Antinot, Acts 11.26, but the thefts and the names and the reapplication of them to other people and the practices is a theme throughout European history, and it was this shell religion that was preached to the slaves. For the remainder of the book, we we'll refer to this religion as the Eurocentric Christianity in order to differentiate from Bible, Bible, Bible Christianity. It's close enough to the truth that a few people question it, but it's far enough from the truth to make it separate false religions. Black slaves weren't allowed to read openly. They were only allowed to teach Eurocentric Christianity the way slave masters told them they could teach it. This form of doctrine and control was beneficial to the slave masters for several reasons. The master told preachers what to preach. Black pastors preached to the master's words of gospel. Black congregation followed these words as gospel. Europeans figured out if they controlled the black pastors, they controlled the people in the congregation, which, at the time, were the majority of the black people. The same tactic would be used again in 1939 by the New Negro Project in order to get the black community to accept abortion as a means of birth control. Slave owners weren't worried about slaves figuring out that they were being taught lies. The same can be said about many churches, black churches today. Black pastors usually attend European seminary, where they are taught Eurocentric Christian doctrine in most cases. The pastor comes out of teaching Eurocentric Christian doctrine to the congregation, which is rarely ever questioned. The congregation follows these words as gospel, and instead of reading scripture to see for themselves, Acts 17.11, one of the biggest lies in Eurocentric uh, Christian belief, doctrine, is that we should never, ever talk about race in the Bible. There are several other false teachings that go in hand in hand with it. The Bible doesn't mention skin color at all. Not true. The Bible doesn't say what Christ looked like. Not true. The Bible isn't about race. Not true. If people claim to be believe the gospel are fighting against asking questions about topics that appear in the Bible, 
It means we should definitely ask questions. People only try to steer us away from the truth when they are scared we'll find something they don't want us to see. So let's ask a question about Adam. What colour was Adam? When we consider Adam was placed geographically, it makes sense for Adam to have a dark hue of skin. We can speculate on what the hue was, or we can take the scripture for a solid answer. And God said, let us make a man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish, the sea, over the fowl, the air, the cattle, all over the earth, and every creeping and creepeth thing upon the earth. The name Adam means red, reddish. Eurocentric Christian doctrine teaches that this meant that Adam had white skin capable of blushing. This is the thing we're going to see come up several times in order for European Christians to get the interpretation they need in order for the text to work with their shell religion. Let's cast aside Eurocentric doctrine and look at what the Bible said. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Genesis 2.7 if we do some digging, literally and figuratively, we'll find that there is a layer of ground and refer to it as clay. This layer of clay is known specifically as red clay. In fact, there is no other such thing as ground dust that looks remotely similar to Caucasian skin in the reed of the world. The White Sands National Monument in New Mexico is the exception to the rule, but neither the Bible nor Eurocentric Christian doctrine teach that creation occurred in New Mexico. We could stop there if there was any piece of evidence pertaining to Adam's colour, but there's more. Let's look at what the scripture says about God's image. There are some that claim that if the Bible wanted us to know what God looked like, it would tell us, and that's what exactly it does. We are given a clear description on the Most High, which includes his colour. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat up the throne. And he sat that he looked upon like jasper and a sardine stone, and that there was a rainbow around the throne, and a sight unto an emerald. Revelation 4, 2, 3. When Eurocentric Christian doctrine and biblical Called Christianity agree is that the stones were used as a way to describe various colors. John used the stones to describe the color of the Father on the throne. Either he chose the stones with purpose in mind or he chose the stones at random, but both possibilities cannot be true. Let's have a look. One thing we notice about these stones is that they are varying in shades of brown, but all brown stones. If we put the image of a jasper stone side by side with the images of raw red clay, their color is almost identical. If Adam was made of the image of God, and both of the description and scripture are similar to color, then it's consistent to believe that Adam was reddish brown, clay-colored man. He was not white, olive, or Middle Eastern. Let's talk about Eve. When it comes to Eve, we need to look much more than color because there are quite a few false doctrines that make her out to be an adulteress and not the mother of some humans. And Adam called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living, Genesis 3.20. If Eve was taken from Adam and then she looked like him in almost every aspect, including skin color, in other words, Eve was the first human clone in history. This is important because of widespread, widespread Eurocentric Christian doctrine that is deeply rooted in racism. The doctrine is known as the eighth day of creation is based on Genesis 2. The eighth day of creation teaches that Caucasians come from Adam and Eve and were created on the eighth day. The eighth day creation teaches that all other races were created before Adam and Eve on the sixth day. Eighth day creation teaches that all races except for the white race are beast races, not descendants from Adam and Eve, and therefore are not human. Understanding these points is important, but understanding why those that hold to the racist doctrine while claiming to be Christians view black people as subhuman. It's embedded in some Euro Eurocentric Christian doctrines starting in Genesis. This belief leads them to interpret Noah's flood in a much different doctrine than the way most of us have heard the story. The only intent of the false doctrine is to reinforce the notion of white supremacy, while also using the Bible to back false belief that all other races are subservient to the European race. They believe that the above declaration of dominion applies to Caucasians and only Caucasians. In order to adhere to this false doctrine, they must also deny Genesis 3.20, which makes it clear that Eve is the mother of all living, regardless of skin colour. But the fact remains that if Adam was a reddish-brown skin man, then Eve was a reddish skin woman. Cain the devil and the black skin. The final deception we're going to address in this section of the curse of the Cain, Christian identity, is a racist, Eurocentric Christian doctrine that teaches that Eve had sex with Satan, Cain was the son of Satan, and after Cain murdered Eve, Abel, God cursed him with black skin. This false doctrine is known by several names. The seed lion theory, the serpent seed theory, the two seed theory. None of the above beliefs concerning Cain are found in the scripture and are in fact contrary to Genesis 4, 1, which states that Adam was the father of Cain. For the sake of the focus of the book, we're going to concentrate on the lie that Cain was cursed with black skin. And the Lord said unto him, Therefore, whoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any... Finding him should kill him. 
Genesis 4.15. The verse does not call the mark a curse, nor does it mention black skin at all. Even though neither of these beliefs are found in Scripture, it doesn't stop some Eurocentric Christians' teachers from spreading the lie. There are two places in the Bible where we see God's mark, and both of those are marks and protection, just like the mark was for Cain, Ezekiel 9 and Revelation 7. In both of the above chapters, God's mark is used as a mark of protection, not a curse. By stating that Cain is the son of Satan and he was cursed by with black skin, they can justify their racist beliefs towards black people. The same belief gives rise to the false doctrine that Cainites were descendants of Cain that survived the flood and currently commit evil on earth. Shepherd's Chapel is one of the most well-known Christian identity sects that teach the false doctrine. If you're learning the doctrine from the Shepherd's Chapel, the late Errol Murray, or his son Dennis Murray, you're being deceived by a racist Christian identity doctrine. The subject is covered in much greater detail in my book, The Serpent Seed Debunked. Ask a pastor. Why would one of the rivers in Eden encompass the entire land of Ethiopia if the garden didn't have any connection to Africa? Two, if the garden was, is on the east side of Eden, what continent is to the west? Three, is it possible for the entire continent of Africa is the land referred to as Eden in scripture? Four, if skin colour is, is an important context Bible, why are there so many references to it in the Bible? Five, why does Eurocentric Christians doctrine adopt a racist view towards people with black skin if skin color doesn't matter? Six, why do Europeans attempt to associate black skin with Satan and a curse if skin color doesn't matter? Seven, why does Eurocentric Christianity attempt to present the white race as a separate creation from all other races if skin color doesn't matter? Eight, why does Eurocentric Christianity exclude Africa as possible location at Eden even though Bible, Bible geography supports it as the only location for Eden? The Breakdown an ongoing theme we will encounter throughout the awakening process is that Eurocentric Christian doctrine is often based on making white people feel superior while classifying every other race as inferior. In fact, we proceed through the Bible, we'll see Europeans are almost always presented in a negative light. In order to combat this, many will claim it's racist to point out these circumstances. They identify whom they believe to be Arabs, but they do not call this racist. They identify whom they believe to be black people, but they do not call it racist. They identify whom they believe Asians, but they don't call it racist. There is a double standard when others identify the bad guys as Europeans. Their existence is built on white supremacy. For anyone to use the Bible to point out the opposition as is a blow to their ego and that they cannot handle. It is because of this many, not all, will reject the truth in favour of a gospel that makes them feel more comfortable. But it isn't the gospel of the Bible. The deeper we venture into scripture, the harder it is to cling to the shell religion, Eurocentric Christianity. Yeah, I heard Christianity was actually four main religions before the Babylon. And he said unto Abram, Knowing of surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them for four hundred years, and also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out of great substance. Genesis fifteen, thirteen, fourteen. So yeah, thanks for watching. Um Yeah. Anyway. Raise your vibrations, please. It's the only way to get through this. Raise your vibrations. Full arm of God, 24-7. Much love. Thanks for watching. Bye now.